My name's Leon. I'm a filmmaker, formerly a primary school teacher. Um, I guess my journey into filmmaking came from a desire to escape racism. Um, you know, racism that I started experiencing at secondary school, being one of six black boys in my year at the private school that I went to. Um, I'd, I'd been called racist names prior to that, but the difference was once I got to secondary school, it was this subtle form of racism where you couldn't point out that someone was being racist. I mean, you knew it, but you couldn't go and report it and say they were being racist because they weren't being explicitly racist. I've lived in London my whole life. When you speak about racism, this is the image that people think of. Straight away, you're going to be like, no hair, tattoos, he's far right, but I'm far from far right. You say you're not, you're not racist? I'm not, I'm not racist saying you I don't know you. No, no, far from racist. If I was you know, racist, I wouldn't be talking to you now, I wouldn't be giving well, you, you know, the time I've, of day. I've had, I've had, um, I've got my, let me tell you, my godson's half cast. I've had to deal with racism since I was a kid. The racism I now face day to day is far more subtle, but no less damaging. It's really tiring and boring to hear that racism doesn't exist or that um, you know it's not so much of an issue anymore and by talking about racism you are partly responsible for keeping it alive and um, you know I don't think that anyone can claim ignorant as an excuse for not being aware of racism what does it take for people to kind of accept that, yeah, racism is still here. Glenda Caesar, one of the Windrush generation, wasn't expecting to be denied a British passport to visit her dying mother in Dominica. In relation to uh, my case, coming here as a baby, being brought up in, in England, known England all my life, have English children, went to, to, um, to school, raised my, 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 my children, paid my taxes, got good jobs, and then all of a sudden I'm told, no, you're not supposed to be here. Um, I started blaming my parents, why did they bring me here then, if this is what I was going to have to put up with in my, you know, later on in life, because I did think I was British. That's what I was put to believe that I was British. It took my mum having to pass away for me to know that I'm not British. Now, you've recently got your passport, but that memory of what you had to go through, you know, it must have had a, a lasting effect on you. It's too little too late, you know what I mean? I still feel as if I still don't belong in England, even though you give me a, a passport to say, you are British, and that's what it says, British citizen. Glenn to see a British citizen. But I'm not British, am I? People like Glenda, uh, my parents, uh, my grandparents' generation, didn't have the freedom, the means to select um, where they wanted to live and were allocated places, you know, your Brixton, Hackney, Lewisham, Peckham. And these are places that at least when I was a kid, were referred to as the hoods, as the ghetto. These were areas that were considered no-go zones for people that weren't from those areas. And, um, but they were safe spaces for us. And, you know, when I was going through racism daily at school, I always felt some comfort in knowing that once I got back home to my area, that the things that were happening in school could never happen in my, where I lived, you know, I, I, I was, 100% confident what was happening at school could never happen where I lived.
I met up with my friend Stuart, a local barber, and Dave, a white father to mixed race children, to talk about how our own community is changing, not just for us, but for our children too. I can remember certain adults that I was like, all right, that person's mum is racist, but that's my friend. Mm -hmm. And we'd all go out and play football with, mm -hmm. with everyone, mm -hmm. with everyone. It wasn't, it wasn't wait for the black kids to come out, it was just, they're playing football. Yeah, you're playing, <laughs> I'm playing. But now, it's the difference between there's something trickling down with the new people coming in, the, yeah, the, the, the gentrification through. wave, yeah, which is, com you know, it's creating a, a clear divide. I've got, I've got a son, when I go to the park, we've got, we, mm -hmm. we spoke about it. We've gone, I've gone to the park, Swing Park in Goose Green, it was like, I mean, like a Tuesday afternoon, so it's like one o'clock in the afternoon, and it, the weather weren't so great. So there's maybe about five other kids in the, in the playground. And my son, it will, it, you know what kids are like. They That's just right. go up to each yeah. other, look That's at right. each other, and then run off and play. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They just look yeah. at each other and say, yeah, yeah we're yeah. children, let's go do this. Yeah, 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 run off yeah. and play. Yeah. So yeah. I've just let my boy crack on, and I've looked up, and I've just seen one parent grab a ute and go, oh, all right, fair enough, they've got to go. And then I've, another, and then, another. and then half an hour later, we're in the park by ourselves. So I thought, this is in my head. Mm -hmm. This is in my head. I'm yeah. not seeing this. Yeah, 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 it yeah. wasn't until I was in the shop that I mentioned it and to other. And I said, what happened to you? Like I, I went there with my black day. child and emptied there. the park. The people that are coming, buying into the area, not from the area. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they're yeah. from a predominantly white area, and they're used to their their expectation is what they've come from, mm. yeah. and they've bought in. They, as far as they're concerned, they've put their money into your community, our community. So therefore, they've bought a right to that part of the community and they've got a, a, a sense of ownership, uh, of entitlement of what their expectation is of that community. And when you don't fit that expectation, then all of a sudden you're the problem. Gentrification is a, a word that I don't recall hearing before about 10 years ago. And now it, um, it pops up all the time in the media, it pops up all the time in conversation and I see it, I experience it every day um, and I guess for me it's a visual, physical manifestation of inequality, uh, financial, economic inequality. You know, there's a whole new wave of people that have come to live in the area, which is fine, but, you know, it's like, the area is now desirable, apart from one thing, and that's us, the original resident. I met up with my friend, Richie Bray, to discuss our experiences of gentrification and how it has affected us. Because of what your identity is, because of the way that you look, you're not allowed to do that. You're not, behave, you're not allowed to behave like that. There are elements of your culture that you need to hide or stop engaging with in order to make the rest of society feel safe. That you as a white person don't have to change yourself to make yourself seem safe. I'm expected to alter the way that I dress, the way that I speak, the way that I come across to make you feel safe. And that's an element of control. You're trying to control my narrative and control my reality based on what you expect. White people have a sense of entitlement to, to all spaces. Yeah. Right? And white people will, for the most part, be quite welcome in and black that's privilege. spaces. privilege, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it doesn't work both ways. If we go into a white space, for example, like these new kind of coffee shops that pop up all yeah, over the place. Yeah, yeah. Now, I won't go into these shops because it is, you can't point, you can't put your finger on it. You can't go to someone who's not black and yeah, say, yeah, yeah. when I go into these coffee shops, this Microaggressions. is what happens. Microaggressions. Yeah, face this is what happens. Yeah, 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 and yeah. The, the, the best thing I can kind of liken it to is, if you are, I've, I've explained this to, to a few white women, is that if you as a woman go into a male dominated like space. Like a barbershop. Yeah, because we are in a male dominated yeah, 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 world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is often a certain energy that comes in that if you yeah. try and explain that to a man, they won't get it because yeah. no one's saying anything to you, no one's doing anything to you, therefore what's the problem? People believe that they're liberal and I think this is what's happening with London now. People believe that they're liberal people, but rather than have conversations with the people they're supposedly fighting for, they make assumptions about them. And that's, they're based on racist stereotypes. So I'm a bit like, well, hold on a minute. You've not even had a conversation with the community to find out what the actual issues are.
Is there a way forward? A way for the wider community to wake up to these concerns? I met up with local vicar Sheridan James to get her thoughts on why white people find the topic so difficult to discuss. I think the first problem is around some white people feeling like they're going to say the wrong thing and that because it's not their experience, not their internal experience, not their cultural experience, that they might say the wrong thing and if they said the wrong thing they might they might appear to be racist. When you're a priest you live alongside those people really closely and because I'm not monoglot and I'm not monoculture, I know how important it is to try and understand what someone else's perspective is, that, that what might be okay for me is different for someone else. Um, and I guess because I'm a vicar of a church that two thirds of the congregation are black, um, I've worked hard to try and understand their stories. They tell me to a certain extent, but because I'm a white vicar, however much I'm trying to build a bridge, I don't completely share that experience. And so mm. I've got to work hard to try and build that knowledge up. What would you like white people to hear better than you think they do? Just hear, just hear without, without saying, yeah, but without trying to compare your experience because there's, there's not a comparable experience. So if I, if I said, you know, the, the world, let's talk about London, getting around on public transport. Public transport is not very accessible and practical for someone who has a physical disability. Yeah. Now, if that person was telling me about their experience of travelling around London and public transport, and then I went, yeah, but this one time I had a broken leg, so I know what it's like. Yeah. Exactly, you laugh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't, I don't know what it's like. It's going to be a bit of a lifelong journey. And maybe it's only through talking and properly listening. If we'd have just rocked up and had a, an hour conversation, mm. it would be good, but not as good as the fact that we've actually been doing this for two or three years. The aim of this film, my hope, is to try and raise the awareness of what racism is, what racism looks like for me, my community and to hopefully get people to reflect and um, you know, go on a journey of understanding and trying to take uh, individual responsibility for changing the way things are. I can't do anything for you, it's not for me and people like me to educate you, it's for you to see the humanity in, in us, in, in the other, and to understand that I don't have the privilege of ignoring racism. I mean, the most I can do is bury my head in the sand, but it's gonna find me anyway. Hey, something's gotta change. Something's gotta change right now. Right now. Something's gotta change, something's gotta change right now, right now. I was just another man when they heard me, yo. But now they see a black man on one of stereo. I feel they're trying to hold me down and won't let me go. I think it's time we educate them like they didn't know, didn't know. We be fathers to our sons and do